The Rational Apprentice podcast is linear rather than topical. This means that the podcast should be listened to in order. This also means that skipping episodes will prevent you from fully understanding the concepts being presented and may cause you to miss or misconstrue vital proofs. That being said, welcome to the Rational Apprentice podcast. William of Ockham was an English philosopher born in 1285 AD in the town of Ockham. Ockham, the name, a merger of the two words Oak and Hamlet, is located in Surrey about 40 minutes by train southwest of London. Now, geography aside, William of Ockham was a prolific and influential writer in the studies of theology, metaphysics, logic, semantics, and even politics. But one specific accomplishment that concerns us today, the one he's most noted for, is his famous razor. Now, while I'm certainly not referring to his personal grooming, the word razor in the context of philosophy has a similar meaning, or use, to the razor for which we're most familiar. A razor is a conceptual tool in philosophy and the sciences to eliminate unlikely causes or explanations for observed phenomena. One might say that a razor allows us to shave or cut away unlikely explanations. Now, William of Ockham wrote his famous razor in Latin, and the English translation reads, Essentials or entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Now, most people think that this means the simpler the better. But that's inaccurate. I'm not saying it's incorrect. I'm saying that it's imprecise. Making the statement the simpler the better is primarily a subjective determination. The concept of better is subjective, right? After all, what I consider to be better may not be your idea of better or anyone else's. The statement, the simpler the better, is also demonstrably untrue in so many instances that it tends to reduce the razor's insight and importance. Is boiled steak better than steak seared with butter, sea salt, and cracked pepper? Is a radio flyer wagon better than a Ford F-150 at towing a ton of mulch from the garden center to your home? Well, hardly, right? So that can't be what William of Ockham had in mind. So let's discuss what else it could be. Hey, I'm Scotty, and welcome to the Rational Apprentice podcast, where we discuss solutions to humanity's problems derived from the application of the scientific method. We also discuss and practice things like logic and logical argumentation, reasoning and evidence, the unknown, forgotten, or underappreciated scientists and philosophers in our history, and of course, the Mind of a Murder Case of the Week. What William of Ockham was talking about, and the true brilliance of his razor, lies in the word essentials. Now, what is an essential? Well, an essential is a postulate, the most primary unproven assumption that acts as an initial statement upon which all other facts within a science, a theory, or a religion are based. It's the foundation upon which everything else in that science theory or religion is built. Okay, for example, in mathematics, we may state any two points residing on a plane, a flat surface, may be connected by a straight line. This is a statement of fact for which I've not provided a proof, but must be taken as either self-evident or simply factual. And based upon that postulate, we perform calculations which, as it turns out, match what we see in reality. Now, in physics, the speed of light being the speed limit to our universe is a postulate. It's not something that's been proven, as by definition, we have no means with which to test the assertion, but it is taken as true and we build upon the foundation. Now, what could we say is a postulate of, say, Christianity or Judaism? Well, what about God exists or God created the universe, right? All right, absolutely. Now, while a postulate is unproven, it must be true and demonstrably so. Okay, we can't use something false as a basis for building, just as we saw with the determination of absolute rightness. Generalizations based upon untrue postulates will also be untrue, and your science, religion, or theory will fall apart. A postulate must be tested for truth, and it must pass the truth test with a 100% record of zero failures in order for it to remain a postulate. Now, why is it that a postulate can't be tested for validity? 
After all, we discussed in great detail the necessity for ideas to be tested for both truth and validity in order to be determined absolutely right. So why are postulates not held to the same rigorous standard? Well, because there's no way to check for validity. A check for validity requires there to be two or more premises. But as a postulate is the most primary premise, there are no premises below it with which to base your postulate. Therefore, you can't check for validity. Now, if we return to our example, any two points residing on a plane can be connected by a straight line. This is a conclusion that has no premises. There are no prior statements, like a point is this and a line is this, therefore, right? We simply take the postulate at face value if it's true. So this is what William of Ockham was talking about, and we use the principle of Ockham's razor as a rule of thumb to minimize the number of, essentially, leaps of faith. So not the simpler the better, but the fewer postulates required the better. And we can see why this would be beneficial. The necessities behind if this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and so on and so on, then our conclusion can happen. It's just far too complex to be useful. It relies on too many factors that must be in alignment. And it's for the same reason that military generals avoid battle plans which rely on a complex array of things going exactly to plan in order to achieve success. Right? We see this every day when we look at our weather apps. How accurate are weather predictions that are more than two days out for locations, okay, outside of California, which has no weather. I mean, there's a reason for the old joke that goes something like, uh, what's the best thing to buy a weatherman for Christmas? Well, a window, right? That's one of my, <laughs> it's one of my son's favorites. So we can determine which theories are most likely correct using Occam's razor. Theories that rely on the fewest postulates tend to be correct. Now, we've discussed Galileo a number of times here at The Rational Apprentice. Galileo was faced with a problem when he was trying to figure out which concept of the structure of our solar system was correct. Now, there were, at the time, two prevailing theories about the structure. The Ptolemaic structure placed the Earth at the center, and all celestial bodies revolved around the Earth, including the Sun. And this was the accepted view. The second was the Copernican structure, which placed the sun at the center and all of the planets revolved around the sun, including the Earth. Now, without getting into too many details, it was possible to predict the movements of the planets and the other celestial bodies with acceptable precision using both methods. We have to remember, of course, that Galileo, Copernicus, Bruno, they didn't have the modern scientific benefits that we have today, right? To us, this all seems so obvious, but to them, this was all new, and this was all unknown. So what tool did Galileo use in his determination that the Copernican structure was the correct one? And to be so persuaded as to go against the reigning dogma under penalty of death. Because as you can imagine, even using his fancy lead tube, he was observing from a vantage point locked here on the surface of the earth. Right? This gave Galileo no observational advantage with which to choose. So what tool did Galileo use in his determination that the Copernican structure was the correct one? Well, he used Occam's razor. As I said, both methods allowed precise predictions of the movements of the celestial bodies. But the Ptolemaic structure was based upon a long list of postulates that made those calculations very complex and challenging to perform. In contrast, the Copernican system was based upon just a few postulates, making calculations and predictions relatively simple. But now this brings up the notion that a solution can be too simple to be correct. Now I'm sure you've heard people use the fallacy, well, that can't be the answer, you've oversimplified. Well, now wait a minute, fallacy, you call it a fallacy. Why do you do that? Well, because simplification is the primary goal of science, to reduce observed complex systems and phenomena to the most straightforward set of generalizable rules. Now imagine saying to yourself, gee, I threw that ball against the wall and damned if it didn't shoot right back at me. Or I pushed that guy out of the way whilst playing football and damned if I wasn't the one who got pushed back. 
Or what about, hmm, I, I, I pulled up my boat anchor and my boat dipped down in the water, soaking my shoes. Now, why could that be? It all seems very complex, right? Now, we could attempt to solve each of these seemingly isolated complex problems with isolated explanations for each phenomenon. And perhaps we'd come up with some explanation that worked, one reason for the ball rebounding, another for the movement of the players on the football field, and yet another reason for your wet shoes. But do you think that they would be right? And do you think that if treated as isolated effects, the explanations would be the same for each observed phenomenon? And do you believe that the answers would be as simple as Newton's equal and opposite law of nature? Uh, to quote Galambos, progress in science is a measure of our ability to discover simpler explanations of nature. But, and this is an important point, does that mean that the simple solution is referring to a simple effect? No, it doesn't. If, for example, you take Euler's polyhedra formula, V minus E plus F equals 2, which relates the number of vertices, edges, and faces of any polyhedron, I doubt that any serious-minded person would conflate the simplicity of the equation with the momentousness of what it means. Or you're probably more familiar with this. What about E equals MC squared? Now, you really can't get a much more simple equation than that. But does the simplicity of E equals MC squared match the complexity of what it represents? Well, no, it really doesn't. It means complex phenomena can be explained using simple equations and complex problems can be solved using simple solutions. In fact, in general, the simpler a concept is, the more difficult it will be to comprehend. Now, moving from physical science to volitional science, it's always been assumed that complex societal problems necessitate an equally complex solution. This is virtually what Steve Herbert, associate professor in the Department of Geography and the Law, Societies, and the Justice Program at the University of Washington states. Quote, beware of people preaching simple solutions to complex problems. If the answer was easy, someone more intelligent would have thought of it long ago. Complex problems invariably require complex and difficult solutions, unquote. Now, oh boy, is that quote filled with logical fallacies. Always beware of arguments using the, if it was easy, someone smarter than you would have figured it out long ago ploy. But H.L. Mencken said something similar. Quote, there is always an easy solution to every problem, neat, plausible, and wrong, unquote. But the problem here is that they're conflating simple with easy. The easy answer is not the same thing as the least complex answer, just as the easy way out is not the same thing as the simplest way out. Those who espouse complexity in their solutions are very often convinced of that necessity because they're not solving the right problem. They're not solving the root cause, Rather, they're trying to solve a symptom. In fact, one of the primary methods you can use to determine whether you have isolated a root cause is by looking at the required complexity of the proposed solution. If a solution is overly complex, you are most likely not solving the right problem. Now, why are we discussing the complexity of solutions? Well, because as I've noted repeatedly in the Rational Apprentice podcast, we have the physics technology to eradicate ourselves. We see this now in the news every day. So we must therefore increase our societal technology to match, to avoid or prevent our own destruction. Now this requires us to build our social studies and our societal structure based upon a science rather than superstition. And if it's going to be a science, we must follow those rules of science that have worked so well in the past. We've gone over many of them. And simplicity of postulates is the next equally important aspect. But it can't be done, say the naysayers. They've said this in the past, they say it now, and they'll continue to say it going forward. And most of them are in the business of perpetually creating solutions. But they're also unwilling to try it. 
They're reluctant to look through the tube. They're convinced that repeating the same methods will finally give them a working solution. After thousands of years of failure, let's just try it one more time. Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, and all the rest, oh sure, they had good intentions, the right ideas, they just didn't do it right. Have we not heard this? If I was in charge, I'd do it this way and kill another hundred million people in the process. Again, in order to avoid or prevent our own destruction, we must, for the first time, build our social studies and our societal structure based upon a science rather than a superstition. Now, this requires no destruction, only construction. And, as with any construction, you must start with a foundation. In science, we call these foundations postulates or axioms. All sciences are based upon postulates, and most of them, the strongest, are based upon only a few. All right, everyone, that'll do it for today. Let me remind you that in order to get the weekly Mind Over Murder case notes, you'll need to sign up for the weekly Substack newsletter. In addition to the Mind Over Murder case notes, we'll have studies, practices, courses, and bonus materials coming out in the near future, and I know you're going to want to get a hold of those when they come out. So head on over to therationalapprentice.substack.com to sign up for free right now. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.